Buenas tardes, Boa, boa Tai. Vamos a empezar el, el simposio de Topcom. We are going to start the symposium uh, Frontiers, uh, an update in Swift Source OCT, OCT and Geography. So, uh, in the uh, last year, uh, OCT and Geography has been a um, very interesting uh, topic in all the, the meetings in ophthalmology. Uh, so that, that, is, that is because the, this technology has been very rap rapid in development and also are increasing the number of colleagues who are users of this new technology. Uh, as we know, this technology uh, is a non-invasive and real-time thing of capture the imaging of the plexus vascular of the retina and choroid. choroid. Uh, so this is very exciting for, for this new technology. But also we have a lot of questions. So today we have the great opportunity to share with two of the most important uh, researchers in this topic, and the Professor uh, Spade and Professor Sada, really are our guests, uh, distinguished guests. So uh, after uh, uh, one uh, lecture, we will have five minutes in, for questions, audience questions. So I would, I would like to, to present Dr. Spade, first speaker. Please, Dr. Spade. Thank you, Dr. Lujan. It's a, really a pleasure to come to your beautiful country uh, and, and speak here. Um, I'm going to first start off by giving some of the basics of optical clearance tomography. And we uh, really uh, would like to ask if you have any questions, just feel free to ask them. Uh, I guess we're going to save them towards the ends of all the talks, but we're, we're here for your service and we'd like to be able to be any use we can. So with spectral domain OCT, the light source is fairly broadband, and it sends in a, like a bucket full of wavelengths into the eye. And part of the light is split by a beam splitter to go to a reference arm, and part goes in the eye. And depending on what reflects in the eye, you get a certain amount of reflection back. And those are combined with the light from the reference arm, and then you get an interferogram. And I drew that interferogram on the bottom. The interferogram can be decoded with a Fourier transform to make a kind of a blip, and that blip represents the, the, what's reflecting light. Now if we move that back, so there's a difference between the, the arm lengths, between the reference arm and what's going inside the eye, you still get a reflection back, but the interferogram has a higher frequency. So there's a kind of a depth encoding of how things go inside the eye in terms of reflection. And if we move it back, there's even higher frequency. So that's a kind of the ingenious part of spectral domain OCT is that there's a depth encoding in terms of the reflections and, and, uh, and the interferograms produced. Swept source, I mean, uh, uh, OCT has many different reflections going on all at once. So the interferogram is fairly complicated, but this can be decoded by a Fourier transform to make an A scan, and a lot of A scans put together make a B scan. The ingenuity of swept source OCT is that everything is depth encoded in terms of frequency of the interferogram is also kind of a weakness because in spectral domain OCT, the detection method is not so sensitive to high frequency interferogram. So there's a fall off in sensitivity with depth. Ordinarily in, in spectral domain OCT, the peak part of the sensitivity curve is put in the vitreous because the vitreous is clear, it's hard to image in the first place. And you can see that the curve falls off in the choroid. So part of the reason why the choroid is dark in, in spectral domain OCT is that there's just a lack of sensitivity there. We can invert that curve and push the curve backwards so that the peak sensitivity is at, near the sclera. And that's the basis of enhanced depth imaging, or EDI-OCT. 
But notice with spectral domain, we have to make a choice. We have to make, we either want to look at the vitreous in the retina or we want to look at the choroid in the retina. We can't look at both the vitreous and the choroid so easily, at this, uh, the vitreous and the choroid at the same time so easily. With swept source OCT, there's selective individual wavelengths are sent in, uh, into the eye, and they make an interferogram. That's decoded, or at least detected by a photodiode, which is a much faster way of, of detecting signals. So there's sequential wavelengths sent into the eye, and the interferogram is built up. It's decoded by the same Fourier transform idea to make an A scan. Many A scans make a B scan. You remember that there was a fall off in sensitivity with spectral domain OCT, so that deeper st structures weren't seen so well. With swept source, there's a little bit of a fall off, almost none though. So the curious thing with swept source OCT is we get a much better image through depth of the eye. We can see from the vitreous to the choroid without selecting any one of those things. We get them all at once. And it, the OCT works at a much higher rate of speed because we don't have to wait for a line CCD to have all the wells charge up. That lets us scan faster. We can do OCT and geography better. We can do wide area scans. The Topcon uh, Triton OCT is really is a, the first swept source OCT on the market. It's a very easy machine to use. It, it's quite uh, efficient in terms of patient throughput and efficiency in examining patients. It's pretty easy to use. You just push on pre-selected sort of scan patterns. And the resultant image as shown here, you can see the vitreous, the retina, and the choroid all in one picture. You don't have to pick anything. You see how wide of a field of view that gets. That's because you have a very fast scan speed and you can scan over larger areas without having to worry about patient motion or other things like that. In addition, the instrument does have, have tracking for the patient's eye which kind of compensates for some of the, the motion problems. There were some additional uh, features built into the machine to enable vitreous imaging. Now, we don't really understand the vitreous all that well, but there's a lot of bursa and stuff like that. We've written papers from our office about the structure of the vitreous, and you can see it really quite well while still seeing the retina. It's a kind of an enhanced feature of the ability to see the vitreous. Now, because we have a big depth that we can image into. If we image a high myope, we can see an amazing number of things. Yes, we can see the vitreous, the retina. Choroid is very thin on a, on a high myope, so that's no easy, th I mean, that's, that's nothing hard to image the choroid. But you can image the full thickness of the sclera, and you can see that both the choroid and the sclera are about as tenth as thick as we would expect in an emetrope. And you can look behind the eye, and you can see fat, and you can even see big blood vessels behind the eye. And it's kind of a curious thing. Maybe we should look at this in greater detail because we could really map out the whole eye and what's behind it in a high myope. Here's another example of really the, the advantage of swept source OCT. Remember swept source OCT also uses a little bit longer wavelength, which is the ability to penetrate particularly through blood. So this patient has a subretinal hemorrhage associated really with polypoidal, but you can see the, the sub-RP hemorrhages. So look through that scan. You can see, look through the retina, through the blood underneath the retina, through the blood underneath the retinal pigment epithelium, and yet we can still see the choroid very nicely. Remember with, sweat, uh, with spectral domain, we had a hard time seeing the, the choroid under ordinary circumstances. Here it's a piece of cake. So I'm going to just talk about one aspect that I've been interested in, and that's using OCT to, to grade non-exudative of early AMD, early and intermediate AMD, and look at how that varies by choroidal thickness. And I think now we can make a, a staging system for the non-exudative or early or intermediate parts of AMD using OCT, whereas in the past they were used color photography, which didn't image a lot of the stuff that's going on. You may recall that Gas really was the one who figured out what choroidal neovascularization was in AMD in the 1960s, and he also found that Drusenor risk factor they're kind of the basis of medical retina. In later studies done by larger groups did quantify the risk posed by Drusen. And the definition for early AMD pretty much became the idea that it was just Drusen. Recall Drusen are a sort of fatty material that's, that's formed underneath the retinal pigment epithelium, high in cholesterol esters, and a number of other things as well, including complement. But Drusen are found in a number of other things. We commonly associate them with AMD. There's about a half a dozen other things that were Drusen are commonly found, although they're fairly easy to differentiate from AMD. Later studies found that focal hyperpigmentation was a risk factor for 
for AMD, and this actually was mentioned even in an earlier paper in relation to type 3 neovascularization. But people accepted the idea that focal hyperpigmentation was part of AMD. So in 2008, the ARIDS group published the paper where they laid out a sort of a, a roadmap for AMD that started with many intermediate or one large druse. And then these patients went to focal hyperpigmentation, and then they could go to coronal neovascularization or geographic atrophy. And that was pretty much was the idea behind AMD at that time. That was not long ago, 2008, uh, less than 10 years. But they ignored a number of different things. One thing they ignored was the idea of pseudodrusen. And pseudodrusen were first described in 1990. They're best seen with blue light, and that's how they were first described. Pseudodrusen is best seen in blue light. They weren't really accepted as a real entity. They were thought to be in an appearance that was arising out of the choroid. But later we showed that they're really the result of deposition of material underneath the retina. And working with Christine Curcio, we characterize this material. It's something like what's found in drusen. Uh, the yellow arrow points to a subretinal drusenoid deposit. Next to that is a druse is partially washed out. In drusen, there may be a little bit more cholesterol esters, where in subretinal drusenoid deposits, there's more free cholesterol. But many of the same things are found in both in terms of proteins and, and the like. In addition, we showed that subretinal drusenoid deposits or pseudodrusen were more commonly found in patients with thin choroids. And it showed that they were associated both with drusen, neovascularization, and eventual atrophy formation. Here's a picture from John Sarks also showing histology of subretinal drusenoid deposits. These patients can progress to a number of different things that I mentioned. Here's a patient just with some subretinal drusenoid deposits. These would have been classified as soft drusen in every study prior to their recognition. Notice there's no focal hyperpigmentation, but this patient eventually does develop geographic atrophy. If you look at big epidemiologic studies, like the Beaver Dam study or ARID study, they, were, they classified pseudodrusen as being a kind of soft drusen. So if you look at the risk that they said that soft drusen had, it's really the risk of pseudodrusen, pseudodrusen plus soft drusen, and soft drusen all put together. We don't really have a good idea how much risk posed by pseudodrusen or by pure soft drusen alone. There's some studies later that came out that showed pseudodrusen risk factors, but we still don't have precise numbers of that because of that error in classification. What's also missing in a 2008 classification was polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, not so much associated with drusen, uh, and that f at least counts for 50% of all neovascularization in Asia. We first described that in our office. We thought it was a kind of a novelty, and we found that mostly in older white women but in reality, it's found more pigmented uh, races throughout the world, and it's a, a very common form of neovascularization. Type 3 neovascularization arises from the retina and dives down towards the, the choroid, or at least towards the RP. It's really not, uh, it's a fairly common kind of neovascularization, but it's really not choroidal neovascularization if you think about it. There's nothing from the choroid that in type 3 neovascularization, at least at first, maybe later it'll join with a choroidal circulation, but early on it's not choroidal neovascularization. So if we look at this 2008 concept of, of AMD, we realize there's a lot of errors or defects in this, in that many of the patients who were thought to have soft drusen really had pseudodrusen. Focal hyperpigmentation is not a necessity in, the, in this rate of progression. Choroidal neovascularization, in, inaccurate term for type 3 neovascularization. And finally, in terms of geographic atrophy, the SARC showed that if patients you think have geographic atrophy, if you actually look at their eye by histopathology, 45% of them had neovascularization. So this 2008 concept is pretty far off the mark in terms of most people in the world. Another way to think about it is just to think that as you get older, sub, there's extracellular deposits can occur. Some we call drusen, those are underneath the RP, and some are above the RP, and we call those subretinal drusenoid deposits. And that's basically, I think, the, the hallmark of early AMD. So it says accumulation of extracellular material in the context of aging. Now, it's not any extracellular material. It's very specific types, quite easy to recognize. And then late AMD is just the development of atrophy or development of neovascularization. We shouldn't really call it choroidal neovascularization since it doesn't always come from the choroid. And this is highly influenced by the choroidal thickness. We found that patients with thin choroids are more likely to have pseudodrusen or subretinal drusenoid deposits. Patients with regular thickness choroids have soft drusen. What about really thin choroids? Well, we looked at a series of patients with really thin choroids, 
We found they generally, particularly say in old high myopes, don't have drusen or pseudodrusen alone, and that's some feature that we still can't figure out. The high myopes are kind of a clue to us that we should be able to figure, figure out. And thick choroid hasn't been mentioned yet, but we did describe a kind of drusen that's found in the patient with thick choroids. And I made a drawing of them here. Notice that the patients on the far left are regular soft drusen, and they're able to find sort of feather edged kind of uh, drusen or accumulations of material that fit together, they often aggregate together, they can even be confluent. Whereas these new drusen have an angular shape with sharply defined borders and have, can have actually kind of strange shapes. These were found to actually occur in people with thick choroids, so I call them pachydrusen, for the simple word. And here's an example of one druse by itself. Ordinarily, if you had soft drusen, there'd be a bunch of other drusen in the neighborhood, but with pachydrusen, they are often found by themselves. Here's some other ones that are associated, again, with a thick choroid. You can see the bizarre shape these have. They're found all scattered throughout the fundus, not just in the center part of the fundus. And here's another patient with these pachydrusen. And look at the kind of strange shapes they have. They're not round or ovoid. They have complex shapes or complex outer borders with a thick choroid. To get an idea of how often these occurred, I looked at 71 consecutive patients uh, with none exuded of AMD, 94 eyes, and I looked at a number of different things about them, their demographics, what kind of drusen they had, and how thick their choroid was, but I excluded patients who had retinal surgery, uveitis, central serous, or the like. And the mean age of the patients was what we'd kind of expect, 78 years, and their mean choroidal thickness was about 240 microns, but you can see there was a, essentially a 12 to 1 ratio in terms of the thickness of the choroid, and it ranged from 52 to over 600 microns thick. Soft drusen were found in 48% of the patients. Pseudo drusen with or without drusen were found in about 40%, and 11.7% had these new kind of drusen, pachydrusen. And indeed, there in this series, the pachydrusen patients had thick choroids, as opposed to pseudo drusen patients, which generally had thinner choroids. Here's a cumulative distribution plot of patients with pachydrusen versus regular drusen. And you can see the pachydrusen patients were on the thick side, as we'd expect, and regular drusen on, maybe on the more normal side, but there wasn't really a sharp, grade, or a sharp cutoff. It was more of a gradient of probabilities. The thicker the choroid was, the more likely these new kind of drusen were to be found. Here, if you could read through this list, there are some of the characteristics of pachydrusen versus regular soft drusen. The regular soft drusen aggregate in the center part of the macula. They're round or ovoid and they have poorly defined border, whereas pachydrusen are scattered throughout the macula, they're not necessarily aggregated together or really even found them close to another one. They have ovoid or complex shapes, well-defined uh, borders. Soft drusen can be confluent. These are hardly ever confluent. Pigment that's found on top of soft drusen is not found so on top of pachydrusen. And the final thing is that you can often see larger choroidal blood vessels behind or in the neighborhood of regular drusen because you can see them, the choroid isn't that thick, whereas pachydrusen, the choroid is quite thick and you don't see blood vessels. Before, people used the term large for drusen, but that ignores the, the shape or the contour, the topography that are drusen, of drusen, and we lost a lot of descriptors by just trying to be simple. So now that you have heard that lecture, I'm going to give you a test. Okay, so you, you see these kind of whatever that stuff is, this extracellular deposit. I want you to, th you can yell it out if you want, or you can just think it to yourself. Tell me whether you think that's soft drusen, whether they're pseudodrusen, or pachydrusen, and how thick the core it is. You can tell just by looking. There's, you don't even have to, to work at it too hard. Is that a thin choroid? as shown there, less than 125 microns. Is it a moderately thick choroid, or is it a thick choroid? So what do you think that is? Is that soft drusen, pseudodrusen, or pachydrusen? We have pseudodrusen as one vote. Anything else? Soft drusen, that's another vote. So how thick do you think the choroid is? Is it thin, is it normal, or is it thick? The answer is that it's soft drusen. Remember, they have kind of ill-defined borders that uh, are somewhat confluent. They're in the center part of the macula. The choroid is 250 microns. That's completely normal thickness. 
So what about this? Here these are small scattered dots. They're in a fairly uniform spacing between them. If you look at the choroid, the, it's easy to see large choroidal blood vessels. Some are turning yellow. What is that? Pseudodrusin, right? And the choroid is thin. So you can see this patient has a 38 micron thick choroid with pseudodrusin. And only is one left, but what, what do you think this one is? Bizarre shaped drusen. You can't really see the choroidal blood vessels very easily. Reddish thing. Pigmentary changes between. Those are pachydrusen, and the choroid is quite thick. So we looked at the genetics of all of this stuff. Patients with pseudodrusen have the same genetic makeup pretty much as patients with soft drusen. So if I told you what the risk alleles of a patient were, you couldn't tell me if they had pseudodrusen or if they had drusen unless I told you how thick their choroid was. If they had a thin choroid, then you would say they had pseudodrusen. Thick choroid or a more moderate choroid, you'd say they have regular drusen. Patients with polypoidal are often associated with thick choroid, but they have the same alleles as regular C and V patients do. So if I told you the risk alleles of a patient, you couldn't tell me if they had C and V or polypoidal unless I told you their race or even more specifically, how thick their choroid was. If they had a thick choroid, they'd be more likely to have polypoidal, regular thickness, C and V. We looked at a patient, a group of patients with pachychoroid, thick choroid, who developed neovascularization, and we compared them to a group of AMD patients. Guess what? Their risk alleles were exactly the same. But we do know that people with thick choroids are more likely to have these pachydrusen, polypoidal, and also to have type 1 neovascularization. So extracellular deposits are, are related to the thickness of the choroid. Patients with thin choroids get subretinal drusenoid deposits. Moderate get regular soft drusen, and thick choroid get pachydrusen. Each one of those can go on to a different kind of neovascularization. Type 3 neovascular, uh, sorry, pseudodrusen go on to type 3 neovascularization and geographic atrophy. Where, say, on the thick side, they're more likely to go on that polypoidal. And the future manifestations, then, of AMD are related mm -hmm. to how thick the choroid is as well. So we start off with risk alleles like ARMS2 and complement factor H. They could lead to AMD over time, given the right environment and systemic factors. But I think it's possible to split this up into three bigger groups, or three smaller groups, on the basis of how thick their choroid is. And there's probably genes that control that as well. So I think that's the next step, is that we're going to look at it further and further, kind of subclassification of, of AMD to get a better idea of how it starts. Right now, we're we're pretty clueless about why people go on to have C and V or geographic atrophy, but I think this may be just another cover of the onion to take off so we can learn a, a better about AMD. So that's the end of this talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Please, question of the audience. Between, uh, do you see any uh, relationship between choroidal thickness and the amount of capillary seen by OCTA? Uh, there is a kind of an inverse relationship th there. I, I don't think anybody's published a paper about it, but it does sure seem that way. We showed that people with pseudodrusen were more likely to have bigger areas of loss of capillaries. Curiously, people with AMD in their fellow eye, late AMD in their fellow eye, have loss of capillaries, but you would expect that to be true. That's a great research project, though. Uh, I have a question on pachychoroid. What is your take on, uh, we, we do see a lot of uh, pachy vessels even in normal patients. So what is your take on their follow-up data? Like, do you expect these patients do have pachy vessels which are actually going to cause some damage to the RP eventually? Or this is like going in inverse direction? Like, what came first, we really don't know still. <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's a kind of a new observation about these packagers, and uh, I have been working with Jemmy Chung in Singapore, uh, which they looked over 600 eyes uh, at a reading center, and, and uh, packagers are a very common form of, of drusen seen in Singapore, and I would imagine the same thing in your country. Uh, I'm working, we're just starting with Usha Chakavarti on a series of patients who have been looked at by a reading center in India, to look for that same kind of distribution of things. So it may have something to do with racial differences or changes in choroidal thickness that may be inherent in some populations versus others. I, I don't know what that is, but it's certainly a, a sign of disease expression. It may go on to 
certain forms of disease as well. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have... Any question? Oh. Thank you so much for your very nice presentation. <laughs> so, next speaker will be the Dr. Sadat. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lujan. Uh, it's, thank you for your kind welcome to your beautiful country and this uh, really wonderful meeting. It's such a pleasure to be here and to participate in this symposium with you and uh, Professor Spade. So I'm going to try to pick up where Professor Spade uh, left, left off. I think he did a wonderful introduction, and he's obviously done a lot of the pioneering work with Swepster Society and this evaluation of the choroid. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the lessons we've learned from evaluating the choroid with Swepster Society, but also talk a little bit about important information that we've learned about optic nerve-related diseases. So these are my disclosures. Uh, and so uh, why has Swepster Society transformed our evaluation of the optic nerve in the choroid. Well, Professor Spade really, I think, uh, described this very beautifully. And he talked about what I think most of us believe is the most important advantage of Swepster OCT is that it has this uh, lack or, or at least a less of a loss of sensitivity with depth, uh, as well as the, the fact that it uses a longer wavelength, which perhaps gives us deeper penetration. And that obviously is going to be a very powerful advantage for evaluation of the choroid and also for evaluating the lamina cribosa uh, of, the, of the optic nerve. So uh, I, I do want to emphasize, though, uh, there are other advantages. It's not just about the deeper penetration. Obviously, with swept source devices, we are able to achieve a higher speed. Uh, and this is actually of some benefit for avoiding missing smaller lesions that might otherwise small, fall between uh, our, our scans, uh, as well as for doing on fast of visualization. So this is an example of a patient who I think the diagnosis is, is, is pretty obvious. You can see the abnormality in the optic nerve, but you can recognize a separate fluid, but also you can visualize that there's an abnormality of the optic nerve uh, that is contributing to this. And in fact, this patient does in fact have an optic pit of related maculopathy. And in fact, what's really impressive in this uh, single, on average, swept source scan is that you actually can even see the abnormal uh, lamina in this particular patient deep within the, uh, uh, the optic uh, pit. This is another patient. This is a patient who has an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. But notice with Swepster OCT, we can actually see the seminal fluid that's actually uh, below this edematous nerve and actually visualize even the choroid uh, below uh, this massively edematous nerve. Again, emphasizing this advantage of having good signal despite depth. And these are all sort of unaveraged uh, volume scans, which I think is actually quite impressive. This is a patient with hypotony, maculopathy. But this is another patient. This is one of the advantages we've seen with Swepster OCT is that we have these patients who have uh, high levels of myopia, and we're able to get imaging into the depth of the staphyloma. Note that the signal really is pretty good in the anterior retina and quite similar to the, to the uh, posterior aspect of the staphyloma. And again, emphasizing the fact that there is less loss of sensitivity with depth using this approach. And of course, when you do high-speed scanning and you acquire very dense scans with very little separation between the scans, you're able to, uh, to generate these types of, uh, of, of uh, OCD projection images, which actually start to really, I think, uh, resemble uh, fundus images. And I think there are certain types of diseases uh, where we have a benefit in being able to visualize our OCT data in this way. And one of those um, entities, I think, where we're finding an important advantage is in studying atrophy. I've been, had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Spade in, in, in efforts to try to, to develop new approaches to, to classifying and, and perhaps even quantifying atrophy. We found some advantage with the deep penetration of swept source OCT. In fact, um, many um, uh, software algorithms utilize the... Um, the, uh, the, the onfos image to the choroid as a tool for, uh, for evaluating um, atrophy, but actually you can even do better by, with swept source OCT because you get such deep penetration and into the, into the sclera. Sclera is actually a nice place if you get a slab, an onfos image to the sclera. It's a nice location uh, to actually quantify these atrophic lesions actually with a high level of reliability we found. 
Another, I think, important um, um, application uh, for Swepsosa ZT is in studying ocular tumors. I'm really not going to talk a lot about that here, uh, but the deeper penetration um, certainly is a nice tool for evaluating uh, small uh, melanomas, uh, as in this uh, example. This patient also obviously has a fair amount of subrenal fluid associated with a small uh, melanoma near the optic nerve. Uh, another entity, um, uh, Dr. Spade introduced this concept of, of, of uh, pachychoroid-related uh, um, uh, problems where you can see drusen, but of course there are other pachychoroid disorders such as central serous um, uh, query retinopathy. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the things we can appreciate with on-FOS viewing strategies is that we can appreciate these very large vessels in the choroid, these so-called uh, pachy vessels, which I think are very helpful uh, in making the diagnosis. And of course, there are a number of entities that uh, really from and, and Dr. Spade, of course, have described that are in the spectrum of disorders that appear to be associated with a thick choroid, choroid or at the very least, these large vessels. Now, one of the interesting things that we observe because we've been able to visualize the choroid uh, using these approaches is that not only is the choroid thick in patients with, uh, with a central serous choroidopathy, the interesting thing is after photodynamic therapy, the choroid thins. And it doesn't just thin where you apply your treatment. It seems to thin throughout the posterior pole, which I think is fascinating and may give us insight into the biology of this uh, disease uh, process. Now, again, um, cortical thickness, I think, as I said, um, is something that uh, Swepsters OZT really allows us to, to, to measure uh, quite easily. And it really is a real credit to Professor Spade. He really was the one who uh, first um, highlighted uh, the potential importance of the choroid and choroidal thickness. He's already talked very nicely about how uh, the choroid uh, can be quite thick in these pachychoroid uh, disorders, uh, but can be quite thin in patients with pseudodrus and myopia. Uh, but uh, but in, in, in fact, you know, uh, there's an additional advantage with Swepsters OCT. Not only can we see the choroid better, I think it's easier for us to do automated quantification. It's why we have now uh, in our instruments, uh, especially these Swepsters OCT instruments, the ability to make measure critical thickness even in an automated uh, fashion. And this is helpful for uh, not just um, AMD but, uh, and pachychoroid um, uh, spectrum disorders, but also other entities, inflammatory diseases in particular. We know in Harada's disease, the choroid can be massively thickened to the point that even with Swepsters OCT, we cannot visualize the posterior surface. But we also recognize that with treatment, the choroid thins. In fact, actually, if I go back, um, I, I should emphasize that many of us use um, a, a, the, the OCT imaging of the choroid and track the progressive thinning of the choroid as a nice way of monitoring our therapeutic response with inflammatory agents. Of course, uh, in patients who develop chronic disease, the choroid can get quite thin. In fact, uh, the thinness of the choroid is actually what contributes to the so-called sunset glow appearance of the fundus in these individuals. And of course, uh, we've studied in collaboration with Narsing Rao uh, that these patients who develop an especially thin choroid uh, actually seem to have poorer vision. So there's, it's actually a nice biomarker uh, for functional outcomes in these patients. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize in my presentation to you today is that we think that there's more information in the choroid, that it's not just about uh, choroidal thickness. And this is a paper that we published uh, last year in collaboration with one of my fellows who returned to an institution in China, at Zhongshan Ophthalmic Center. Uh, and uh, many of us have seen patients uh, maybe referred to us who've been confused between Harada's disease or central serous uh, choroidopathy. And of course, both of them can feature thick choroids and you don't always see a lot of inflammatory signs in every Harada's patient. Uh, and so, of course, the treatment is very different. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. You don't want to give a central serous patient steroids. Uh, and so uh, you don't have to be an OCT expert to realize, yes, the choroid is quite thick in both these entities, but I would argue the choroid really looks quite different in these two entities. You can recognize the vessel profiles quite well in patients with central serous where they're often obfuscated and diff difficult to differentiate in patients with Harada's disease probably reflects the inflammatory infiltration. Uh, and so, in fact, this can be measured quantitatively. Jay Chablani, who just asked a question, has been one of the people who's been uh, involved in this type of choroidal vascular, um, vascularity index type of research. But the point is, you don't even have to measure it quantitatively here. You can actually make the differentiation just by studying the OCT as long as you're able to get this type of high-quality choroidal 
imaging. In fact, we've, st we've gotten interested in studying choroidal reflectivity or brightness of the choroid in various diseases. And we started to observe that, you know, actually it's different in these different diseases, it seems. But there is one challenge though. One challenge though in assessing brightness in OCT scans is there are a number of things that can affect the brightness of these scans. Just a patient having media opacity or maybe your photographer forgot to put artificial tears on their cornea you get a dim signal. How can you possibly compare brightness uh, in a meaningful way when you have all of these confounders? So we've been very interested in using normalization strategies to try to adjust for these types of uh, differences. For example, use other reference structures in the eye, uh, the vitreous, uh, for example. And we found that, uh, for example, this is, this is a choroidal um, uh, brightness map actually, and this is before and after normalization. And the point is you can even actually even out, even within a cohort, uh, the chordal signal across the posterior pole using this type of normalization strategy. But it's a very um, uh, useful technique, I think, for adjusting for these types of, uh, of differences uh, between, um, uh, between um, individuals uh, or across a population. But the problem, though, with using such a strategy, in fact, we've done these are a number of diseases where we've um, plotted the quantitative choroidal brightness, if you will, and you can see it's different across diseases. Uh, but the problem, though, with this type of normalization approach is that, yes, it might be able to adjust between scans or between patients, but it doesn't adjust for the fact that the brightness drops with depth. Professor Spade very nicely showed how uh, with a spectral domain OCT, you get this significant fall off in signal. So a patient with a thicker choroid, naturally the, the most posterior part of their choroid is gonna be dimmer because of that loss of signal. So how do you manage that? And this is where I think swept source OCT really shines and has been crucial for us to be able to study these questions uh, reliably. In fact, this is a paper that was published earlier this year in ophthalmology. This is a collaboration we had with Antoine Brezin uh, and his group in Paris, where he has a very large cohort of patients with birdshot. In fact, we studied 220 patients with the Atlantis um, 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 Swepsers OCT. Uh, and we observed that, in fact, uh, patients with birdshot, uh, even if adjusting for um, uh, thickness of the choroid, they did have a brighter choroid. Perhaps that doesn't surprise anybody here because maybe you might expect that they might have some uh, choroidal uh, infiltration. But we studied this in other conditions as well. So uh, Professor Spade talked about how actually patients who may have just soft drusen and no funny shaped drusen or pachydrusen or no pseudodrusen, they can have a relatively um, normal choroid for age and refractive error. Uh, and that, that, that's, uh, that certainly has been our observation as well. But we are very interested in studying uh, drusen burden in eyes and, and drusen volume, and we've studied the genetics or the heritability of drusen volume. But we're interested to see um, you know, um, how that might map to chordal thickness um, as well as chordal brightness or chordal intensity or reflectivity. And what we observed was that in fact, uh, there was no correlation between how thick your choroid was and how much drusen you had in terms of drusen volume. But we did observe that patients who had brighter choroids, something else abnormal about them, they're infiltrated in some way, um, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, those patients seem to have more drusen. Now, this was a single study. We do have a, actually a subsequent study, which haven't published yet, that's replicated this finding. I'd like to see it in larger cohorts, quite frankly. Uh, but it is an interesting observation uh, that uh, perhaps uh, we should study other elements of the choroid aside from simply uh, its uh, thickness. Now, of course, you don't have to stop at the choroid. Um, I think that the lamina curvosa is an area of uh, great interest. It's another paper that we published earlier this year in collaboration with our glaucoma group, in particular Vic Chopra at our institution. Uh, and we studied a normalized uh, brightness of the lamina curvosa. And Joel Schumann has actually done some nice work in this regard as well. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, but in any event, uh, we observed that in patients who had a glaucoma, uh, they actually had a lower um, uh, normalized lamina curvosa intensity uh, compared to glaucoma suspects. And why is that? Well, we think it's probably because of the fact that simply patients who have glaucoma lose their nerve fibers, probably have um, more uh, laminar pores, and that actually, those laminar pores are dark, and that probably contributes to an overall lower intensity. But it's a nice, quick and dirty way 
of, of actually um, a quantifying that type of damage. In fact, we actually found a nice correlation between laminar carbosa intensity and the visual field mean deviation. Okay, so I want to I want to uh, finish my talk uh, in this uh, in the second portion uh, to talk a little bit about uh, OCT and geography. And there's a good question that was asked about OCT and geography uh, because there are some advantages we believe of subsurface OCT in evaluating um, uh, the choroid and, and, and optic nerve in particular uh, related to OCT and geography. So you know, actually, you can do quite good OCT and geography with spectrum OCT. So why do you need swept source? Why does it matter? Well, uh, Professor Spade already highlighted one of the things, which is it's, it's faster and you might be able to scan a larger area. It might be able to do more averaging uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, but there may also be an advantage of greater depth per, uh, penetration, which could be of benefit in certain circumstances. We actually can visualize the query capillaries, I think, quite well with spectral OCT. But if you have disorders where there's substantial retinal thickening or other abnormalities, this is where having uh, less drop-off in signal with depth, which you get with swept source OCT, is in fact an advantage. Uh, in addition, as I said, because it's faster, you can cover larger fields more easily. So of course we can montage scans, but uh, less montaging may be necessary uh, if you're able to scan these larger areas using a swept source strategy. But I think one of the biggest advantages, though, is if you have um, high-speed uh, swept source OCT, you can actually more easily average multiple scans. And, and averaging scans really can substantially, and we've published on this recently in ophthalmology, uh, can substantially improve the quality of your OCT imaging and can have substantial impact on the quantitative measurements that you obtain with OCT and geography. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, swept source OCT, I think, uh, can do a nice job of evaluating the choroidal circulation. As I said, you can get very nice um, imaging of the choroid capillaris in, in, in normal patients with, uh, with spectral domain OCT. But you do um, see uh, some signal even in, the, in, the, in some of the medium vessels we've observed with swept source OCT compared to spectral domain OCT. Although even with swept source OCT for the very large vessels, in the absence of RPE atrophy, uh, it's very difficult to see the flow because there is uh, still uh, some loss of signal. Uh, we can talk about all of the reasons for that if there's interest. Uh, now, uh, uh, you know, uh, Carl Guttenberg at TopCon has uh, done some very nice uh, processing. This is not OCT and geography, uh, but because you get good um, signal uh, in the choroid, you can use the structural OCT alone uh, to, and you can sim sim simply invert the signal, so you make dark bright, and you can actually reconstruct some maps of, of the choroid. To be clear, this is not flow information, this is structure information, and that's why they've selected a different term of vasculography to describe that, that finding, but it does give you a nice depiction of the larger choroidal vessels. Okay, so again, um, you know, CNV is a little bit of a segue, I think, from evaluation of the choroid itself, uh, but certainly OCTA seems to be an interesting tool uh, for evaluation of choroidal vascular lesion. Professor Spade has led um, several group, um, focus groups on behalf of the Macula Society to try to get some type of consensus uh, on evaluating these lesions uh, using OCT and geography, although I think we're probably a little ways away from a consensus in this regard. Uh, but in any event, uh, we certainly can see the neovascular complexes quite well, and I think um, <coughs> Professor Lujan will show other uh, cases and examples uh, using OCT and geography. This is a patient who actually had a, a type 1 neovascular um, lesion uh, and then developed a recurrence which actually broke through the RPE into the subrenal space, so actually developed a type 2 component as well. And they can be well seen here. You can see the type 1 uh, component and then the type 2 component, which actually they look quite similar uh, on OCT um, and geography. Uh, this is just sort of a side by side uh, showing uh, that additional outgrowth into the subretinal space. Uh, but in fact, we can see a variety of different uh, patterns. We haven't really found a big difference between type 1 and type 2 lesions uh, in terms of, uh, of of OCT and geography. What really matters, though, is how old the lesion is. This is an example of a patient who had a long-standing 
uh, a, a, a type 1 membrane. You can see the neovascularization here on the structural OCT under the RPE. And you can see in the area corresponding to the old type 1 neovascularization that these are fairly large vessels. There's fairly large gaps between them. And then this patient developed a new area of, uh, of recurrence, which was a type 2 type of recurrence in the subretinal space. The type 1 and type 2 is not so important. It's more important that this is a relatively newer lesion, and you can see that the vascular density is quite different between the older and newer components of this particular uh, lesion. Here's just uh, more examples of different patterns one can, uh, can see. And of course, you know, we're still all struggling, I think at least I'm struggling, to, to best define the role of OCT angiography uh, in the setting of critical vascularization. Uh, but one role that I found it to be quite helpful uh, is in patients where I'm finding the dye-based angiography somewhat challenging to interpret. Uh, and the classic example is in patients with pachycoroid disorders, like a patient with chronic central serous. And you're trying to determine, is there any coronal vascularization? And it can be very difficult sometimes to make that distinction when there is extensive RPE disturbance present. In that situation, if you're able to obtain an OCT angiogram and visualize the vascular network, like in this case, then you can be very confident, I think, in your assessment as long as you've interpreted the OCT angiogram correctly. Just, this is just a, um, well, a, a 3D illustration, not so important, but, uh, but uh, Professor Spade has shown some very nice examples, not necessarily for quarterly vascularization, but in the setting of other retinal vascular disorders where this type of volume rendering can be of benefit. And I think we will ha there is something to be learned uh, from studying the 3D morphology of these lesions, which I think is facilitated by having uh, dense, uh, dense scanning. Okay, the other thing we can do uh, that we've started to do in reading centers with OCT angiography of these curly vascular membranes is actually quantify the membranes. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we can measure them uh, and we can study them over time. We can measure their areas. We can measure the vessel density uh, uh, and the like. What do we do with this information? We don't know yet because this is still uh, early days uh, for that, but we can certainly see changes over time in some patients with anti-VEGF therapy, and so there may be a role uh, going forward in the future. One thing I do uh, want to caution about is some people are using OCT angiography already to modulate their anti-VEGF therapy administration. I, I would caution against doing that so far because I think you know, we have lack of real data on how best to use this. So I think for now, it's a useful tool um, to, to, I think, diagnose in certain circumstances I mentioned, uh, but I don't think I would use the information to affect my, uh, my uh, decision to retreat a patient with anti-VEGF therapy. Now, actually, I have to confess, for our own research group, our area of, of greatest interest is not critical devascularization, but actually in studying atrophy, and geographic atrophy is very well studied with OCT angiography. Uh, in fact, uh, because of the loss, because of the absence of the RPE in the chorea capillaris, you actually are finally able to get good signal into the larger vessels, and actually you're able to see the flow in the larger blood vessels in areas of atrophy. And of course, in areas where the RPE is intact, you can still, uh, excuse me, uh, visualize the chorea capillaris here. But that's actually not, what is, is not what's interesting. What's interesting is what's happening in this area at the edge of the atrophy. There seems to be, I think everyone can appreciate, there seems to be a relative loss of choreocapillary signal there. Do you see how it appears darker? So if you actually measure the density, you'll actually measure a reduction there. And this has been shown by many groups, Nadia Wahid, Jay Duker at Tufts have, have published some very nice cases of this. Um, and, and so in fact, you know, this is where we find uh, that there uh, seems to be some benefit with Swepsis OCT in terms of doing more repeatable quantification of the choreocapillaris density uh, in these uh, types of cases. But I think what's actually more fascinating is looking at the choreocapillaris uh, within the bed of atrophy at the margin of these atrophic lesions. So there's the margin of the geographic atrophy in this case. But look here. If you look at this zone, uh, this area within the bed of atrophy, I would argue that the appearance here is quite different, for example, than the appearance here. There's some partial preservation, we believe, of the choreocapillaris uh, there. Again, obviously, this is all presumed because we don't have histology for this particular uh, case. 
But in any event, these areas of partial preservation, I think, are quite interesting because uh, Giovanni Sterenghi had published uh, this nice paper in ophthalmology where he um, uh, observed that there seemed to be a difference between patients with Stargardt's disease, late onset Stargardt's disease, and AMD. And we know that in many clinical trials of GA, we often have patients with Stargardt's who are mistakenly enrolled or sent into the reading center for these studies, because some of these patients with Stargardt's can present late. So Professor Sterengi showed that in fact, with ICG in these patients with Stargardt's disease, the ICG in the late phases remained dark. He in fact called it dark atrophy, as opposed to AMD, where the ICG in the late phases actually appeared to be bright within the bed of atrophy. And with OCT angiography, he was able to demonstrate, or at least um, propose, that, that that difference in terms of the appearance of the atrophy in the late phase ICG between AMD and Stargardt's was due to relative or partial preservation of the chori capillaris in patients with Stargardt's disease compared to, to AMD. So lastly, in my last couple of minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about OCTA and glaucoma because I think this is going to be a very interesting application. And we did a study to see whether we can use OCT angiography to differentiate uh, between um, uh, glaucomatous patients and, and normals. Uh, and so we specifically studied the vascular density around the optic nerve. Uh, and this was, a, this was our cohort, it's a relatively small um, study, just recently published. Um, but in any event, um, uh, we studied patients with glaucoma, preparametric glaucoma, uh, and, and normals who were age matched. And of course, Professor Spade was one of the first to point out how OCT angiography allows us to visualize and evaluate the radial peripapillary capillary network. So we imaged these patients with a swept service OCT. And then we actually, quite frankly, we didn't know what we should study. So we didn't know, should we study the entire cube? Should we look at just the circle? Should we look at just the ring or just the disc surface? We didn't know. So we studied all of them separately. Okay, uh, and this is the paper that was uh, published earlier this year on this topic. And sorry about all of these words, you don't need to read all that. Uh, basically, the bottom line is um, that, and I apologize in the back if you can't see the numbers, but basically we observed that eyes with mild glaucoma could be differentiated from eyes with preparametric glaucoma, uh, and which could then be differentiated from normals uh, based on these OCTA-derived retinal vessel density measurements. So let me show you a couple of examples. This is just an example of the type of loss of density that one can see uh, associated with this glaucomatous optic neuropathy. And so here's a couple of other examples. Here is a patient you can see the nerve fiber layer loss on the, on the nerve fiber layer analysis inferiorly uh, in this patient. And of course, that corresponds to an area of capillary density loss on the OCT angiography. Uh, and it also nicely correlates with the superior visual field defect in this particular patient. Uh, this is just another case. This patient has in the right eye both superior and inferior nerve fiber layer loss. In fact, there was superior and inferior uh, capillary density loss, which also corresponded to superior and, and some inferior visual field defects uh, on the Humphrey uh, perimetry in this particular patient's example. Now, go back for a second here. You might ask, well, okay, in all these cases, it correlated with the structural OCT. So why do you need OCT and geography if you can see it on the nerve fiber layer thickness? Well, the reality is that the nerve fiber layer thickness map can sometimes be difficult to interpret, for example, in myopic patients. So there are certain situations where we think the additional finding from the OCT and geography can give you an additional level of confidence. You can really believe it when you see it on the OCT angiogram. In addition, it's not just glaucoma. It's other optic neuropathies. So in collaboration with Alfredo Sedun, uh, we had published this paper, um, I think, last year um, on looking at um, uh, swept source OCT in a variety of different optic neuropathies. And we found that we could actually track disease progression quite nicely uh, using OCT angiography. And you can imagine immediately a application which is very relevant to, for example, neuroophthalmology. Let's say you're dealing with a patient with papilledema from maybe pseudotumor. And you're trying to decide how aggressive do I need to be to control this patient's intracranial pressure. 
Well, you know, you'd like to intervene before they actually lose nerve fibers, and it's hard to evaluate the nerve fiber layer thickness with, uh, with OCT, because it's thick from the papilledema. So this is where OCT and geography we found to be a very helpful tool, because we're able to appreciate the loss of the capillaries, or the early loss of the capillaries in these individuals, and hopefully we can intervene before there is substantial uh, visual field injury. So to summarize, uh, Swepsis OCT and OCT angiography, um, I think, represent significant advances in our ability to evaluate and understand diseases of the choroid and optic nerve. So I've highlighted just a few examples. Professor Lujan is going to, I think, illustrate many others with some very nice cases. But I think they've given us new insights into pathophysiology of AMD and also pachychoroid disorders. They've given us an improved ability to monitor inflammatory choroidopathies. And I think they, the, the, the real exciting new applications are the ability to identify and differentiate early glaucoma and potentially track a variety of optic neuropathies. And certainly I think they've expanded the role of OCT in our ma management of patients with posterior segment diseases. That, gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, any question, the audience? Some questions of the audience? Okay, thank you so much for a nice presentation. That, that really was a masterful talk. That was, yeah. it was great. <laughs> but now we have the star, the <laughs> local hero, Dr. Sylvia Lujan. He's going to show us some cases, and it's going to be the highlight of the whole meeting. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. It was very good talk. Uh, first, to start my uh, today's speak, I want to say thank you so much to the brilliant uh, speakers, the guests, uh, distinguished guests, uh, for the researchers, for the uh, innovation in the ophthalmology, and of, of course for the apport of these uh, new uh, uh, technologies. Uh, to, to be their uh, practice in the ophthalmology. Thank you, Dr. Spey. Thank you, Dr. Sala. I, 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 can I just interrupt one second? I would understand a little bit better if you could speak in Spanish. All right. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, today we have the opportunity to have a, a, in real time, non-invasive, a lot of information about the, this technology. Hemos tenido la oportunidad en tiempo real, no invasivo como es Swift Source, de tener eh, un, un, una transmisión de conceptos nuevos, eh, creo, brillantes. Mi presentación, por favor. Sí. ¿Tienes mi laptop? Ah, oh, ok. Eh, bueno, yo lo que quería el día de hoy es mostrarles mi experiencia en este último año que he empezado con esta nueva tecnología. Estoy en lo que se llama la Learning Core y para mí ha sido una experiencia uh, bastante buena en, como una ayuda más en mis diagnósticos. Creo que en lo que es las vasculopatías hemos tenido este, eh, la mayor ayuda en cuanto a retinopatía diabética. Y veamos un caso de una paciente que viene quejándose de baja visión, eh, dos años de diabética y solamente está con dieta y metformina. Pero si vemos, luce muy normal la vasculatura del plexo superficial y el plexo profundo. Sin embargo, tenemos aquí otra paciente en la cual ya este, hay un daño. Y esto es lo que le llamamos a... Uh, diabéticos sin retinopatía diabética cuando los examinamos clínicamente. Es decir, solamente eh, existirían daños estructurales en los plexos, pero aún no hay hemorragias, no hay exudados. Entonces, esto es una de las cosas que nos ayuda. Este es otro paciente al cual operé y se quejaba a pesar de haber alcanzado un 20-30 y era el único ojo, cosa que me parecía este, injusto. Pero cuando le hice eh, el, el OCT angiografía, pude ver que su plexo no estaba del todo bien y él con alguna razón o sin razón se quejaba de los resultados. Esta es otra paciente que vino a una consulta con una agudeza relativamente buena, diabética, 
Y si ven, cuando a la hora que le hicimos la angiografía, podemos ver proliferación. Y ella, ella aparentemente no sentía ninguna molestia, venía por flote, pero al momento de hacerle ya una angiografía más grande, entonces pudimos ver una flor angiografía, pudimos ver que había áreas de isquemia. Entonces, es todavía el, el gol estándar, la angiografía que hemos venido utilizando uh, en nuestros pacientes diabéticos. Oh, ahora ya tenemos eh, eh, algún, una nueva tecnología para poder este, eh, evaluarlos. En cuanto a los pacientes con edema, esta era la única forma que teníamos hasta antes de los CT angiografía. Y como se ve, eh, no se puede ver el plexo con la angiografía fluoresceínica. Esta es este, la evolución después de recibir uh, inyecciones antiangiogénicas y como ustedes pueden ver, casi se recupera totalmente la estructura del de el, el plexo superficial y, y, y profundo. Esta es otra paciente que, como ven, venía por floaters, una, una visión relativamente eh, buena, pero miren el, el grado de este, eh, eh, isquemia y proliferación que teníamos. Y este es el nuevo software que permite hacer estos mosaicos, en los cuales este, podemos extendernos hasta cuatro o cinco campos y, 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 y formar este tipo de imágenes eh, completas del, del fondo. En cuanto a las eh, vasculopatías por eh, eh, oclusiones venosas, el problema en el tratamiento de las oclusiones venosas siempre ha sido que sabemos cuándo empezar, pero no sabemos cuándo terminar, porque hay que colocar y colocar inyecciones. Y como ven, este eh, caso que aparentemente era muy sencillo, ha recibido una serie de inyecciones y sigue todavía en tratamiento. Ten, recuerden, tenía 20, 30 de visión y realmente este, eh, eh, era una oclusión de rama de, de segundo orden, pero sin embargo tenía eh, mucha este, eh, alteración de la vasculatura en el plexo superficial y en el profundo. Esta es una, una, una señorita de 26 años que eh, el único factor de riesgo que tenía era que tomaba anticonceptivos. Y vino con ese cuadro que ustedes ven, es muy, muy este, impresionante, eh, con pérdida de visión, pero sin embargo podemos ver que no había este, eh, áreas de isquemia, o sea, era una oclusión más este, eh, eh, congestiva. Y sin que le diéramos ni un tratamiento, la, la recuperación fue de 20, 20, un par de semanas. Esta es este, las, las eh, imágenes que se pueden obtener del fondo y que puede uno ver a qué nivel estaría la oclusión. El doctor Sada nos ha presentado este, algunas imágenes espectaculares acerca de cómo se puede ir hasta la lámina cribosa y evaluar qué es lo que está pasando a ese nivel. Este es otra paciente que, vino, eh, que tenía un edema por oclusión, una secuela de edema, catarata, y entonces estaba en la encrucijada entre operarse la catarata, nadie la quería operar, y ya los tratamientos antiangiogénicos previos que había tenido no habían resultado. Sin embargo, comenzamos a tratarla con Ailía, y fíjense cómo se ha reconstruido la vasculatura, y tenemos actualmente una visión de 20 y 60 después de extraerle la catarata. Son casos que le estoy presentando que ocurren en, en, en la práctica diaria que tenemos. Y luego en, en, en oclusiones, eh, perdón, en las membranas cordiales neovasculares, tenemos las membranas de tipo 1. Este caso los quería presentar porque es una paciente que vino por segunda opinión, a decir si seguía tratándose o no porque le estaban inyectando. Cuando hicimos el OCT en geografía vemos que habían vasos maduros y decidimos simplemente observarla. Y como ven, mantiene la visión ya estaba mejorado porque son quistes que se forman en estas lesiones eh, fibrovasculares crónicas. Esto es para presentarles cuál era el parámetro que seguíamos para retratar a nuestros pacientes. Era básicamente el OCT, primero el Time Domain, después el Spectral Domain. 
Sin embargo, creo que tenemos un nuevo parámetro. Si ustedes observan, a pesar de los tratamientos que ha llevado esta paciente, eh, el, el complejo vascular se mantiene. Y este es el, es el último examen que le hemos hecho. Ustedes ven, la, la, la lesión, el complejo vascular está tan grande como al, al inicio. Esta es una membrana tipo 2. Se puede ver la respuesta inmediatamente y sin que este sea invasivo. Esta es una paciente que fue este, estudiada en Estados Unidos, en el Corps of Wilmer, y que le dijeron que tenía la forma SEC. Era una señora de 80 años este, con enfermedades multisistémicas y tenía cataratas. Cuando vino a nosotros, le dijimos, hicimos el examen antes de la, de la cirugía y tenía esta lesión en los dos ojos. Costó mucho convencerla de que tenía una patología húmeda, porque le habían dicho recientemente en Estados Unidos que tenía una patología seca y que era muy poco probable que vaya a tener la forma húmeda. Esto ya lo habló el doctor, pero voy a presentar este caso. Este es un caso de una eh, efusión coroidea. Era un marquesani, que ustedes saben que tiene la esclera muy gruesa, y que vino a nuestro consultorio y se puede ver en, en el, el, la congestión que hay a nivel de la corio capilares. Esto es un día después o dos días después de la cirugía, en la cual ustedes saben que hay que hacer unas uh, esclerectomías a nivel del, del, uh, de la parte posterior y este es el resultado de esta paciente. Esto es respecto a lo que es este, la central serosa, en las cuales... Eh, mucho se ha discutido acerca de si los antiangiogénicos funcionan o no funcionan en esto. Yo lo que pienso es de que en algunos casos han tenido membranas cordiales neovasculares y ahí ha funcionado, porque nunca han habido estudios eh, comparativos acerca de si funciona o no funciona. Y esto es algo que salió publicado en la revista de retina y que nosotros cuando lo veíamos no sabíamos qué cosa era. La etiología no se conoce. Sin embargo, vienen... Eh, esto, esto es una non-conforming y hay el conforming que están pegados los dos, los, los, los dos tejidos y se dice que puede ser inflamatorio pero está ligado a las paquicoroides eh, en la revista de febrero de retina eh, hay un, un, una muy muy bonita este, presentación y, y esto es más o menos la angiografía del, del, del caso Luego vimos las macular dystrophies. Aquí tenemos un chico que lo venimos siguiendo de mucho tiempo. Miren, este es el ojo sano con 20-20 de visión. Sin embargo, si ven, ya tiene una membrana. El otro ojo ya lo tuvo hace un tiempo con pérdida de visión y ese complejo fibrovascular que, que es la, la etapa terminal de las... Esto es algo que quería mostrarles. Esta es una paciente que fue operada de agujero macular y estamos haciendo un estudio para ver cómo se reconstruye la vasculatura en torno a, a, a la curación de estos pacientes. Como ven, es bastante bien la recuperación, pero sin embargo, cuando hicimos este examen, encontramos que a nivel de las células ganglionares había una merma. Y si viéramos un poco en el... Si viéramos en esta parte, esto es lo que ocurre cuando operamos un agujero macular, un adelgazamiento a los 7, 8 meses, que no lo notamos al, al comienzo de, 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 una, de una cirugía exitosa. Y por último, es algo que también ya presentó el doctor Sada, un caso de un estarga, con su este, eh, OCT en geografía. Muchas gracias. gracias.